Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you guys again. I have to say, I've been riding solo to church for about two months. And today, I didn't have to be. (laughs) My beautiful wife has come back. (laughs) And I am happy and excited, and she's brought the little one. And this is his first day at church. So if you see him, just say, hello, happy Sabbath. He might be asleep or he might not say anything back, but that's okay. It's in his heart. Amen? (laughs) But it's good to see everyone again this morning. Let's open our Bibles yet again to Acts. And let's go straight to chapter 19. And I will read verses 13 through 16 again in your hearing. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version. That's Acts chapter 19, verses 13 through 16. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leapt on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them, so that they fled out of that house, naked and wounded. Our sermon title for this morning is Identity Theft. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for blessing us and allowing us to make it here on this beautiful Sabbath day this morning, O Lord. But we've come, Lord, to hear from you. And we're asking, Lord, that you'll speak to us now through your holy word, Lord, through your scriptures, through this text. Holy Spirit, be with us. Connect us to your heart, O Lord. Connect us to your mind. Allow us to hear and understand what you're thinking. Use me now, O God. I am your servant, Lord. Fill me, Holy Spirit, and allow your words to pour through me at this moment now, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. This story is, it's unsettling, isn't it? When you read this text, and really when you read a lot of texts in the Bible that have to deal with demons and deal with people dealing with demons, the stories, they, they bring a certain chill over you. But this story in particular seems to be a little bit extra chilling. And it's really because when you read through it, when you see the story, you've got these men that are trying to do something that you would think is God ordained, in trying to get rid of evil spirits and in trying to overcome demons. They even use in this text the name of Jesus Christ. And yet, even though they use the name, they're still overcome. They're still defeated. And the very demon that they're trying to get rid of overpowers them. I know when I read that, it, it, it's unsettling because I would think that there's some sort of power in Jesus' name. Just a few weeks ago, I preached a sermon about the power of the name of Jesus. I I spoke about us as a community, and as a community, we're supposed to have this special thing. We're supposed to have this power that only comes from Christ. And it's something that's supposed to set us apart from every other community that is on earth. We are supposed to be able to speak the name of Jesus in confidence and in power, knowing that when we speak his name, something good will happen. But when I read this text, the opposite happens. When I read through other passages in the Bible, I see so many different stories of of wonderful and amazing things that happen when the name of Christ is invoked. You see lame men being healed. You see the blind being able to see. The dead are raised. Demons are cast out. And all of this is in the name of Jesus. 
I even hear stories today in different countries, even in this country, different regions of the world where the name of Jesus is spoken and the exact same thing happens. People are healed, demons are cast out, bonds are broken, people are baptized. Amazing things happen when the name of Jesus is spoken. So what's the difference here? What's going on in this text? Why is the name of Jesus being invoked and why is there no power? Well, as I I read the text and as I began to study and as I began to really break apart this story, I realized that everything in this story is not as it seems. You see, the problem in this story isn't the fact that the name of Jesus is being spoken. The name of Jesus has a power that's attached to it. The problem is with the people that are using his name. And if we're not careful, we'll fall into the same trap as the sons of Sceva in this story. So let's look at this text. Let's look at chapter 19. And if you go back to the beginning of chapter 19, it starts off with Paul. And during Paul's ministry, he goes through different countries in Asia, which we would know now as as really Greece and Turkey. And at the beginning of chapter 19, he ends up in Ephesus. When he gets to Ephesus, there are various things that he does. He runs into a group of gentlemen who have been baptized, but when he meets them, he realizes that they have no power. And he finds out that they've only been baptized to the baptism of John, and they haven't learned about the Holy Spirit. So Paul teaches them about the Holy Spirit, lays hands on them, and suddenly they receive power. Suddenly they're speaking in tongues and suddenly they're able to prophesy and preach with the same power as the disciples when they received the Holy Spirit way back in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. As Paul continues to go out through the region, he begins to preach. He preaches at a synagogue and when he preaches at the synagogue, they kick him out. So he decides to go to one of the popular schools in the area and he preaches the gospel there. And he does this for two whole years. And the Bible says that when he preaches, everyone hears the gospel. Jews, Gentiles, everyone that's living in the area, they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And because of his preaching, they begin to believe. When we get down to verse 11, the Bible says that Paul begins to do extraordinary miracles. Really, the proper wording, it says that God began to do extraordinary miracles Through Paul. You see, when you read verse 11, it says that handkerchiefs and aprons that simply touched Paul's skin were being sent out among the region and people were actually being healed. Let's read the text. Verse 11, and I'll read verse 12. It says, And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that he had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. So just by a touch of something that touched Paul, power from God was released, and people were healed, and their demons were taken away. Now, you think this is amazing, you think this is extraordinary. Even Luke has to say that these miracles were extraordinary. They they weren't like the other miracles that the disciples were doing because Paul wasn't even there. Paul wasn't saying anything. But people were experiencing the power of God through the things that Paul touched. But why were these extraordinary miracles taking place? You see, Ephesus was a place of extreme spiritual activity. It was a place that was steeped heavily in the occult. There were magicians and different types of people that were coming through this area that were speaking spells and invoking demons. So the people in Ephesus were familiar with the supernatural power of the spirits that surrounded them. So you see, if Paul just went through and touched someone and healed them, no one would have been surprised because it's something that they would have seen all the time. If Paul went through and prayed over someone and called on the name of Christ and an evil demon came out, 
that's something that they would have expected. Because again, they have their own spells, they have their own incantations to get rid of evil spirits, so they would not have been surprised. But to see something so powerful as a piece of cloth that had simply touched someone that was connected to this God, this Jesus that Paul was speaking about, to see that extreme power of that thing getting rid of those evil spirits, getting rid of those sicknesses, that was unheard of. And for that person to not physically be there, that was unimaginable. You see, what God was doing in this region is He was trying to reach the people of Ephesus with what they understood. You see, when God is trying to reach His people, He reaches them in a way that they will understand. His methods might be unconventional, but it's God. So even though His methods might be different based on the places that He needs to reach people, His message is still the same. And the message that Paul was bringing to these people was still the same. Jesus Christ has died for you. He has forgiven you of your sins. And now you're free. So the people in this region, they notice this. They see this. And again, there are magicians and all these different people that are in Ephesus that are practicing these things. And they're seeing and hearing what Paul is doing. So some of them say to themselves, wait a minute. This Jesus must have some kind of power that I'm not privy to. Let's start calling on this Jesus. Let's start using this Jesus' name. Paul can do it. Why can't we? So now we enter the text. We get to verse 13. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists, in other words, they're traveling exorcists, they undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the name of Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Now in reading this text, you see that they're Jewish. So you would think, oh, whatever it is that they're doing, it must be in line with God. Because, hey, they're Jewish, they might not necessarily accept Christ, but they accept Yahweh. They accept the true God. So the things that they're doing, they at least should be in line with what Moses laid out as the law. They must be working within the confines of Judaism. And when you read verse 14, it says that specifically these seven sons of Sceva, their father was a high priest. So they must have some level of extra righteousness. There must be something that is within them that helps them be successful. So when you read it and you see them saying, Oh, I adjure you by the name of Jesus whom Paul proclaims. There must be some power there. They've got to be right in some way or form. But when you study what a Jewish exorcist is, you realize what they're doing is wrong. You see, a Jewish exorcist was not someone who was right with the Mosaic Law. They weren't doing things the way that God had prescribed them through Moses. They were using spells. They were using incantations. They were using Babylonian practices. They were using practices of the region around them. They were simply using the things that were in the area with them to make money. To continue with their practice. Ellen White actually talks about them and says that these particular Jewish exorcists, they were actually, they left Judea because they were doing so many things that were wrong. And they figured that if they went to Ephesus, they could be accepted and make that extra money. So, wait a minute. These Jewish exorcists are doing exactly what you're not supposed to do. They're using the problem of that area to get rid of the problem in that area. They're using occult practices to get rid of the occult. They're calling on demons to get rid of demons. And you see, when you read this in the Greek, when you read what it is that they're saying, when they say, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims, 
you realize this word adjure means they're using some sort of spell. They're using some sort of formula. They're using some sort of incantation. And they're taking Jesus' name and placing it in the spell. What they're really doing is they're trying to take the name of Christ and use it for themselves without being a part of the Christian family. It's almost as if they're posing as Christians themselves. Almost as if they're posing as people that follow Christ and using His name and trying to use His power so that they can gain financially. If I'm not mistaken, that is identity theft. When you decide to take on someone else's name, when you decide to take on someone else's identity, use it for yourself, and try to use their power for financial gain, that is the very definition of identity theft. And here we see these men using the name of Christ as if they follow Him. Now, we look at this text and we say, oh man, this is... This is bad. This is terrible. What are these guys doing? They're in here pretending to be Christians. They're pretending to be something they're not. And they dare call on Jesus' name to get done what it is that they want to get done. But have we looked at ourselves? Have we really looked at this text and understood what's going on and, and taken that text and looked deep inside ourselves and looked at even our church and said, wait a minute. Am I doing the same thing? Am I guilty of identity theft? As a church, as a community, are we guilty of using the name of Christ for our own gains? Let's think about this for a second. Again, these men are using the problem of the area to get rid of the problem in the area. So let's look at the problems of the world. Let's look at the problems of our community. Right now, you would all agree that we have some serious political problems. It doesn't matter what side you're on, we got problems. But wait a minute, if I'm in the church, and I'm using politics, scheming, lying, trying to get ahead, but I'm doing it in the name of Jesus Christ, it seems like I'm using the problem to solve the problem in Jesus' name. It looks like I'm guilty of identity theft. If I'm in the church, and I look at the world, and I see racism, and sexism, and all of the other isms that put people down, that are used to puff myself up, but I see myself in the church doing the exact same thing, not sitting next to people in the pews because of the color of their skin, not allowing people to do certain things because they're a different sex from me. Judging people based on who they are. It seems like I'm using the problem to solve the problem. In our personal lives, if I'm still lying, if I'm still being just as mean, if I'm still being just as uncaring, if I still can't seem to help my neighbor, and yet I come to church every Sabbath and I stand and praise the name of God, it seems like I'm guilty of identity theft. And church, let me tell you, if we've gone down this list and we find ourselves in it, we've got a serious problem. Because when you look through this story and you continue on, you might fool the people on the outside. You might even fool some of the people that are sitting in the church. But when it comes to dealing with the devil, he's going to sort you out. And he's going to find you. And the power that you think that you're accruing, he's going to throw it right back in your face. As we continue to go through this text, we see what happens to these men in verse 15. It says, But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus, I know. Paul, I recognize. But who are you? In the Greek, what he's really saying is he's saying, Jesus, I've experienced. Jesus, I know. I was in heaven with that guy. I've seen his power. I know him. 
I've come down to this earth and I, I've had a hard time because I know Jesus. This Paul that you're talking about, yeah, yeah, I've studied him. I understand him. I'm acquainted with him. He's, he's got his own thing going on. But you, who are you? You see, what's happening is this evil spirit recognizes that these men are not associated with the people that they're proclaiming to know. I mean, really, when you think about it, look at what it is that these men say. I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. You see, you might not know this, but Jesus was actually a very common name. So these men, has to, they have to specify what Jesus they're talking about. There's no way that they know Christ. There's no way that they know Jesus. This demon knows that and literally throws their spell right back in their face. He says, yeah, I, I know Jesus. And this Paul dude you're talking about, okay, I've heard of him, but you, I know you're not associated with any of them. You have no power. I see right through you. I was just with you yesterday. It's a scary thought. You see, remember, we have a mission as a church. Our job is to go and seek and save the lost. You see, the Holy Spirit goes and he does his work. And the Holy Spirit sends people to us so that we can get them into the church and help them along in their discipleship journey. You think the Holy Spirit is going to send us folk? If we're still aligning with demons ourselves? If we decided to go out and try to get people, you think the people that are dealing with those different spirits are going to look at you and see you and say, yeah, I want to be a part of that? They're going to see right through you. They're going to see that you're lying to them. They're going to see that you're, be you're not being who you say you are. They're going to see that you're not being genuine with them. Because they're not seeing Christ in you. You can't just go using the name of Jesus Christ without having faith in the Jesus that you're proclaiming. You can't just go around saying Jesus' name if you have not established a relationship with the Jesus Christ that you claim to know. People will see right through you. And you know why? It's not because of the people. It's because of what we're actually dealing with. Paul says it in Ephesians. We're dealing with spiritual warfare. We're not just dealing with different personalities. We're not just dealing with hunger. We're not just dealing with homelessness. We're literally dealing with demons on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you are not right with Christ, you will have no power. And understand what it means when I say right with Christ. Because I'm not talking about perfection. I'm not saying that your entire life has to be in order. There's a difference between the alcoholic that's trying to get rid of it versus the alcoholic who's okay with where they're at. There's a difference between the person who is struggling with whatever it is that they're struggling with Knowing Jesus, working with Christ day after day, trying to exercise their own demons versus the person who was friends with them. Versus the person who was comfortable with where they're at and does not want to move forward. You see, when Paul was doing these things, I can guarantee that Paul wasn't a perfect person. If you remember, Paul used to be Saul. He was the guy that was going around persecuting the church, remember? I'm pretty sure that Paul had some pretty interesting things and interesting stories that were inside of him that he could tell you. I'm sure that there were some things that as he was going along had to change because, remember, he was raised a Jew and he thought that the things that he was doing were right. So think about the personality problems that Paul might have had. The different issues that Paul could have had maybe the anger in dealing with people. And Jesus had to work on Paul to get rid of those things. And it didn't just happen like that. If you read Paul's letters, it took him a lifetime to get rid of those things. 
You see, it's the struggle that is the sign of the Holy Spirit. It's the struggle that is the sign of Christ. But if you're okay in who you are, if you're okay with your demons, if you live your life working with those demons day after day and try to sugarcoat that with the name of Jesus, you're going to be in a world of hurt. Look at this text in verse 16. And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Again, it, it, there's more than what you're seeing here in the text because in Greek this word leaped, it's only used once. You have to actually go to the Greek version of the Old Testament to see what this word leaped actually means. It's used to describe the Holy Spirit descending on a person. It was used in the Old Testament to describe the Holy Spirit descending on Saul. So when this man leapt on them, it was more than just a physical leaping. Yeah, he might have jumped on them physically, but he jumped on them spiritually. Pushed them down. When it says master, the word includes Lord. He pushed them down physically, spiritually. Lorded over them. In other words, spiritually he overpowered them became their Lord and then physically overpowered them, ripped off their clothes, sent them out wounded and naked. When you're fighting against the devil, and we all do, when we're fighting against those things that we're trying to get rid of, because that's the devil. Yeah, we have sin and we have chosen to do sin. But again, every day, it's a spiritual fight. Every day we're fighting demons. When we're in that fight, but we're trying to get rid of the demons by using our own demons, you're going to be spiritually overpowered. You're going to be spiritually overmatched. Those things that you're trying to get rid of, they're going to become Lord over you. And you will be exposed, hurt, and shamed. Just like these men. But as I read, and I realized what was really going on, and I realized that these men were trying to use Christ's power without having a relationship with Christ, suddenly the answer became simple. Keeping with the idea of identity theft, let's pretend that you're the thief. And you go up to a person and you reach into their pocket. Ah, you got their social security card. You reach in again. Ah, I've got their credit card. You reach in again. Ah, I've got their driver's license. Then that person turns around and sees you stealing from them. You're caught. It's over. It's done. And the person says to you, you know, if you just asked me, I would have given all these things to you. If you just asked me for my stuff, I would have given it to you freely. If there's something about my name that you wanted, I would have given you my name. It's no problem for me. It's free. In fact, the reason I keep these things in my pocket is so that I can go and give them to people. Look, I've got extras. You see, we're, it's so funny because we think that we have to use our demons to get rid of demons because it's all that we know. But there's this Jesus who came down to this earth, who took on our flesh, took on our infirmities, went to the cross, died for our sins so that we could take his identity. He did this so that we could have his power. 
He did this so that we could overcome these demons. He did this so that we could have spiritual peace in this life. Here, He did this so that we could have victory. You see, these sons of Sceva, if they had actually followed Christ, if they had actually listened to the things that Paul was preaching, and they accepted Jesus as their Lord and personal Savior, and they continued to invoke Jesus' name, those demons would have been defeated. Those demons would have been gone because they had truly accepted Christ. There was no need to lie. There was no need for deception because Jesus was offering it to them freely. When you think about the difference between them and Paul, there's not that big of a difference. They're all human beings. They're all sinful. The only difference is that Paul accepted Jesus Christ. Paul was converted. Paul was baptized by the Holy Spirit. You see, when you're baptized, what the Jews believe is that the person that you're baptized under takes possession of you. They own you and you take on their name. And when that happens, they give you the protection that comes from their own power. All you've got to do is accept Jesus Christ. And here's the great thing about Christ. He doesn't care who you are. He doesn't care where you're at. He doesn't care what you've done. When you look at this story and you say, oh, these men have been using demons. They've been aligning themselves with the devil himself. That's why Jesus came. He came to set us free from those kinds of things. He doesn't care about the power of the devil. He created the devil. He just wants you. Don't think that you're too far gone to be accepted by Christ. Don't think that your sins are so great that you have to fake it to make it. Don't think that you're such a bad person that when you come to church on Sabbaths, that you have to proclaim the name of Christ and still live the same life that you've been living. You can take it all because Jesus wants to give it to you. And he wants to give it to you freely. There's no need for identity theft. Because the one that you're stealing from wants to give it to you. Unconditionally. No strings attached. Nothing special that needs to happen. He just wants to give you His free gift of eternal life. To close, I just want to have us all stand. And I want us to think about our weeks, think about our lives. And I want us to think about those things that we don't think that Jesus can get rid of. Because here's the thing about those things. Those are the things that are dangerous because those are the things that you get comfortable with. Those are the things that you learn to live with. And like the sons of Sceva in this story, you begin to glaze the name of Christ over those things. I want you to take those things in your mind. I'm going to give you a few seconds. And I want you to give them to Christ right now. Put them in His hands. Don't... Worry about your struggle. Don't worry about having to get rid of it because Jesus is going to help you get rid of all those things. I want everyone online to do the exact same thing. And in your mind, pray to Him. Give it to Him. Put it in His hands. Let Him have it.